Second, there is a suggestion made by Gould and others that the waste and suffering involved in evolution is evidence against theism. Philip Kitcher puts it like this, he says, when we envisage a human analog presiding over a miniaturized version of the arrangement, it's hard to equip the face with a kindly expression. And then he goes on to suggest, um, had a benevolent creator proposed to use evolution under natural selection as a means for attaining its purposes, we, we could have given him some useful advice. <laughs> I'm not sure how such advice would be received. <laughs> but of course, we don't require current evolutionary theory or current science at all to tell us that the animal world is full of predation, death, pain, and suffering. Alfred Lord Tennyson noted that, quote, nature is red in tooth and claw well before 1859, and no doubt some suspected it even earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Still, current science gives us reason to believe that suffering and death have afflicted the human and animal world for a much longer time than was ordinarily thought before the 19th century. It has therefore given us information about the extent and duration of animal suffering, including human suffering. The first thing to see here, I think, is that this is a special case of the so-called problem of evil, a problem that is alleged to afflict theistic belief. Sin and suffering do indeed constitute a problem or perplexity for theism, although it may be hard to specify precisely what the problem is. Most atheist thinkers have given up the idea that the existence of sin and suffering is logically incompatible with theistic belief. Some kind of inductive or probabilistic anti-theistic argument is presumably what's at issue. It has proven surprisingly difficult, however, to give a really plausible statement of a probabilistic argument from evil, and as these arguments become more complex, they also seem to become less convincing. Surely, however, sin and suffering and evil present some kind of problem, or at least perplexity, for theists. <coughs> the existence of so much suffering and hurt in God's world certainly seems to call out for an explanation of some sort. And what current biological science adds to the problem is that predation, suffering, and death have been going on for a very long time. But does this put any additional pressure on the various theistic or Christian responses to suffering and evil? My own favorite response is the, quote, O, o Felix Culpa, unquote, response, according to which all of the really good possible worlds involve divine incarnation and atonement, or at any rate, atonement. But then all of the best possible worlds also involve a great deal of sin, and as a consequence, a great deal of suffering. Some of this suffering is on the part of non-human creatures. Christians think of suffering, both human and uh, non-human, as due in one way, in one way or another, to sin, although not necessarily to human sin. There are also Satan and his minions, who may, as C.S. Lewis suggests, be involved in one way or another in the evolution of the non-human living world. But learning that sin and suffering have been going on for longer than we had originally thought shouldn't raise any additional difficulty for the old Felix Culpa response. Suppose we learn that our world with all its problems, heartaches, and cruelty will endure for millions of years before the advent of the new heaven and the new earth. That wouldn't have much bearing, one thinks, on the viability or satisfactoriness of this response to evil. The new heaven and the new earth, after all, will exist for a vastly longer period than our current sad and troubled old world. Um, officially, at least, it will be such a long period that uh, the length of time our current sad and troubled old world exists isn't any proportion of it at all. But the same goes, I should think, for our learning that our world with all the ills it's heir to, has gone on for much longer than originally thought. Current science shows that suffering, both human and animal, has gone on much longer than previously thought, but it doesn't thereby diminish the value of Christian responses to the problem of evil, and in this way doesn't exacerbate that problem much, if at all. Finally, there is the claim, perhaps made more often in the oral tradition than in print, that the hypothesis of unguided evolution is simpler, more in accord with optimistic in injunctions than the hypothesis that God or other intelligent beings have shaped and guided the course of terrestrial evolution. Here two points are relevant. 
First, even if unguided evolution is more optimistic than guided evolution, it isn't at all clear that the former is all things considered superior as a hypothesis to the latter. It involves fewer kinds of beings, yes, but that isn't the only relevant consideration. Another is their respective likelihoods, that is, the probabilities of the living world, more exactly, the variety of the living world, coming to be by way of these two hypotheses. Let D be the proposition that the variety of the living world has come to be by Darwinian processes, E the relevant biological evidence, G the proposition that evolution is unguided, and U the proposition that uh, is guided, sorry, and U the proposition that it is unguided. Then our question is, which, question is, which is greater, the probability of D on E and G, or the probability of D on E and U? It is, of course, overwhelmingly difficult to make anything like reasonably precise judgments here, but perhaps um, we can make sensible comparative judgments. Consider first P of D on E and G. Clearly, God could have created living things by way of natural selection, causing the right mutations to arise at the right time, preserving the relevant populations from disaster, and so on. He could also have allowed other intelligent creatures to be involved in the whole process. Again, it is overwhelmingly difficult to estimate the probability that this is the way in which it, is fact in which it has in fact happened, but P of uh, D on E and G is perhaps not terribly low. What about P of D on E and U? Going all the way back to St. George Mibbert, critics have expressed serious doubts as to whether the eye, for example, could have come to be by way of unguided natural selection operating on random genetic mutation. Could, that is, apart from absolutely stunning improbability. The eye, the mammalian brain, and other organs remain difficult problems for unguided evolution. But the really hard problem here for unguided Darwinism isn't the development of macroscopic organs such as eyes and heart. The heart problem is rather at the microscopic, molecular level, the stupefying complexity of the living cell, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic. So, for example, Bruce Alberts, who's president of the National Academy of Science, uh, when he wrote this, says, nearly every process in a cell is carried out by assemblies of 10 or more protein molecules. Indeed, the entire cell can be viewed as a factory that contains an elaborate network of interacting assembly lines, each of which is composed of a set of large protein machines. It's only in the last half century or so that this enormous complexity has come to view. Um, the eminent uh, scientist Ernst Haeckel summed up 19th century opinion when he declared the cell, quote, a simple little lump of albuminous combination of carbon. Of course, it's widely assumed that, in fact, the cell must have come to be in that fashion, but there's little by way of serious argument for the conclusion that it's coming to be in this way is less than prohibitively improbable. On the other hand, as I said above, Michael Behe has proposed a serious and quantitative argument for the opposite conclusion. Given the stunning complexity of the living cell with its enormous complications, together with what we know about mutation rates, the age of the Earth, population sizes, and the like, it seems reasonable, or maybe not unreasonable, to estimate that P of D on E and U is exceedingly low, perhaps orders of magnitude lower than P of D on E and G. If this is right, then even if we think U as an explanation is optimistically superior to G, it is inferior to G in that the relevant likelihood is lower, 